Good morning. Please rise. of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, and the love of God, and the communion of the Holy Spirit be with you all. Amen. Brethren, let us acknowledge our sins, and so prepare ourselves to celebrate the most sacred mysteries. You were sent to heal the contrite of heart. Lord, have mercy. Lord, have mercy. You came to call sinners. Christ, have mercy. Christ, have mercy. You are seated at the right hand of the Father to intercede for us. Lord, have mercy. Lord, have mercy. May Almighty God have mercy on us, forgive us our sins, and bring us to everlasting life.
us pray. Almighty, ever-living God, who govern all things both in heaven and on earth, mercifully hear the pleading of your people and bestow your peace on our times. Through our Lord Jesus Christ, your Son, who lives and reigns with you in the unity of the Holy Spirit, one God, forever and ever. Amen. A reading from the first book of Samuel. Samuel was sleeping in the temple of the Lord, where the ark of God was. The Lord called to Samuel, who answered, Here I am. Samuel ran to Eli and said, Here I am. You called me. I did not call you, Eli said. Go back to sleep. So he went back to sleep. Again, the Lord called Samuel, who rose and went to Eli. Here I am, he said, you called me. But Eli answered, I did not call you, my son. Go back to sleep. At that time, Samuel was not familiar with the Lord, because the Lord had not revealed anything to him as yet. The Lord called Samuel again for the third time. Getting up and going to Eli, he said, Here I am, you called me. Then Eli understood that the Lord was calling the youth. So he said to Samuel, go to sleep, and if you are called, reply, speak, Lord, for your servant is listening. When Samuel went to sleep in his place, the Lord came and revealed his presence, calling out as before, Samuel, Samuel. Samuel answered, Speak, for your servant is listening. Samuel grew up, and the Lord was with him, not permitting any word of his to be without effect. The word of the Lord. the 
book, it stands written of me. I delight to do your will, O oh my God. Your instruction lies deep within me. reading from the first letter of St. Paul to the Corinthians. Brothers and sisters, the body is not for immorality, but for the Lord, and the Lord is for the body. God raised the Lord and will also raise us by his power. Do you not know that your bodies are members of Christ? But whoever is joined to the Lord becomes one spirit with him. Avoid immorality. Every other sin a person commits is outside the body. But the immoral person sins against his own body. Do you not know that your body is a temple of the Holy Spirit within you, whom you have from God, and that you are not your own? For you have been purchased at a price. Therefore, glorify God in your body. The word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. The Lord be with you. A reading from the Holy Gospel according to John. John was standing with two of his disciples as he watched Jesus walk by. He said, Behold the Lamb of God. The two disciples heard what he said and followed Jesus. Jesus turned and saw them following him and said to them, what are you looking for? They said to him, Rabbi, which translated means teacher, where are you staying? He said to them, come, and you will see me. So they went, and they saw where Jesus was staying, and they stayed with him that day. It was about four in the afternoon. Andrew, the brother of Simon Peter, was one of the two who heard John and followed Jesus. He first found his own brother, Simon, and told him, We have found the Messiah, which is translated Christ. Then he brought him to Jesus. Jesus looked at him and said, 
You are Simon, the son of John. You will be called Cephas, which is translated Peter. The Gospel of the Lord. Father, we acknowledge that you are unbelievably in love with each of us by name. We acknowledge that you are alive, that you reign, that even now this morning, as we might be awake or not very awake, whatever it is that we bring to Mass, to Holy Mass, to this Holy Mass, on our minds or on our hearts, that you have something that you want to reveal to us, that you want to speak to us, for you are alive, and you are concerned with our lives. Lord, open our ears to hear you, and grant us the grace to respond like Samuel, that we might truly Say, just as the antiphon and the psalm, Behold me, Lord, I come to do your will. All this we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. I thought it'd be really good to wake us up with some statistics this morning, which you probably really excited me to say. There's a, uh, a way, as a priest, I've learned so far that tend to get lots of emails, as probably most of you get in your own normal lives, working or whatever it is that you do. So I've learned very quickly that emails start stacking up in the inbox, and obviously there's prioritizing, so there's some that are very urgent, and there's some maybe that aren't so urgent. That being said, I, I'm not saying I'm great at this, but I try to read, at least glance at all of what I get, and we get some striking uh, just kind of, I wouldn't call them like news blurbs, but they're, they're kind of like um, various apostolates that might email us with, you know, something to kind of catch your eye, like a, a, a nice catchy head title or kind of fact about the church right now. Well, I got one, I think it was about in the last five, seven days, and they were quoting a Pew Research poll, a recent one, just on some of the, you could say, the the signs of the church, or like if you were to take the church's temperature, how's she doing right now? Maybe particularly in our own country, but also throughout the world. And this is what the statistics, again, Pew Research Poll, put forth. So I invite us just to listen to these for a moment. 61% of the general population of Catholics, so roughly half, only half, maybe barely more than half, actually attend Mass every week. That's kind of significant because perhaps we might have learned this you know, years back or we've heard it said, to miss Mass on Sunday or on a holy day of obligation is a serious and immortal sin. It's no kind of, no, it's... Certainly not something that we can just say, no big deal. Now, right now, obviously, we're in a crazy time. We're living in this pandemic. There's a dispensation from the archbishop. Obviously, if you have health concerns or, you know, because of COVID or maybe you're elderly or whatever, there's, there's reasons why we've, we've been dispensed. We can obviously attend Mass online. We could simply uh, read the readings at home and pray and kind of honor the Lord's Day. But this is a very unique time. Typically speaking, we just can't pick and choose when it is that we want to attend. And why is that? I don't mean to say a lot of the same things that I normally say, but two things, actually. One is because God, the one who has given us life, everything that we have, is worthy of our worship and our adoration. We have, not to be kind of old and crusty, but we do have a duty to give God praise, 
to give him adoration, to worship him. And that's what happens here at Mass. And in addition to that, as I've mentioned before, I know here, and not to use the same stuff, but Jesus, the one who is encountered by the two disciples today in the Gospel, the one who is Lord over heaven and earth, wants to give you himself. And that's what happens here at Mass. It's very, 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 very important. It's union with God. It's no just, well, I guess I can kind of blow that off this week and I'll get to it a few weeks down the road when I have more time because i got soccer or something to go watch this weekend. So that's just one thing. Almost half of Catholics don't attend Mass every week. That's one sign of where we are. Of those aged 21 to 29, 81%, the number goes up, do not attend Mass weekly. Two out of three Catholics do not believe in the real presence, so they don't actually believe, whether it's because they've never been taught, or they've just never, maybe never been taught, and never, the grace has not taken root in their heart. Two out of three Catholics don't actually believe, or maybe don't even know, that Jesus, the Lord of all, is present in the most holy Eucharist, body, blood, soul, and divinity. 45% of Catholics, again, I'm kind of, when I say the statistics, so think about this, almost half of Catholics have never, ever, ever been to confession. I don't mean for any of this to sound like condemning in the slightest. I read that statistic, and I would say simply from my own personal experience, I don't know how you live if you happen to find yourself in that statistic. Again, not in the slightest way trying to beat anybody over the head. It's just, I don't know how you would not go insane, go mad, without the grace, the wondrous gift of the mercy of our Heavenly Father. He longs to forgive us. He longs to make us new. He longs to set us free from our sins. And when we don't confess, we find ourselves divided from God. We find ourselves divided from one another. And in a certain sense, we find ourselves divided from our very selves. It eats at us. It festers within us. It steals the life that God wants to give, wants us to have. Almost half of Catholics have never been to confession since 2000. So I remember that when everybody was storing up their uh, Campbell's soup and stuff, and we were thinking about the, you know, this might be the end or something like that. So since 2000, the, the new millennium there, Catholic weddings have decreased by 54%. Since 2000, baptisms have decreased by 49%. 30% of Catholics do not even believe that hell is real. 30%. Only 7% of millennials raised Catholics still practice the faith. Only 7% of my generation who were raised Catholic actually still practice the faith. 85% of Catholics have would think very, very clearly without hesitation that it's not a problem for a man and woman to live together before marriage. 60% of Catholics favor or strongly a favor the idea of same-sex marriage. 56% of Catholics think abortion should be legal in all or most cases. And the list goes on and on and on. Obviously, the church herself has been badly scandalized by the sexual abuse crisis the number of Catholics that leave the church because of that is astounding. And it's, it's a, don't get me wrong, it's, a, it's an enormous tragedy, a horror, and a scourge on the church. Over 70% of Catholics leave the church before age 23, those that are leaving, of those that are leaving. The statistics just go on and on and on. It was a massive list that I got in my email. You might say if perhaps you're in business, or if you're in kind of the real world, you could say, as I kind of like to joke sometimes, we're maybe not doing so well. If that's kind of like our, our, our report card, if you will, or our, our health check, things aren't going quite so hot. So there's a couple things I want to put before us today, mindful of the thing I just mentioned, the statistics, the state of things. I want to put before us three things today. One of the reasons, at least that I would argue, that we're in or we have those statistics, what we're actually invited to this morning, mindful of the readings, especially the gospel and first reading, and where are you? 
as we hear the word of God this morning. So what's one of the reasons why we have the situation that we have? What we're actually inviting to or what the Lord himself is inviting us to do? And where are you? Obviously, what we just heard in these statistics, in a certain sense, dramatically contradicts what we heard from St. Paul. He says the body is not for immorality, but for the Lord, and the Lord is for the body. We go through those lists, whether it's sexual immorality, living together, all these things. There's some clear contradictions that are happening within the life of the church. And you might catch or you might tune in. I don't know how you get your news nowadays with everything on podcasts or online, and whether you still do it the old-fashioned way with the, the Wall Street Journal or the, the Times or something at the kitchen table, or whether you tune into the app or the, the, the feed on CNN or Fox News or MSNBC or NPR, or whether you listen to some podcast or some talking head kind of giving you the headlines, you might hear amidst all those sources that the answer to this, the answer to these staggering statistics, the answer to the the trial in the church, the answer to the, the, you could say, just the abysmal health report that we just got a glance at is for us to get with the times. Some would say, well, the, come on, the church is like living in Middle Ages. This is the 21st century. Maybe you should update things a little bit. Don't you think you're a little out of date, Father? Or Archbishop or Bishop or whoever it is that we're addressing when we have those thoughts or when perhaps when the news stations say these things. There's all these headlines often. Well, if the Holy Father, he, he mentioned this, so that means that things finally might be kind of changing, getting more modernized or getting with the times. There's a huge resurgence of that kind of thinking right now. And our brothers and sisters, and I do say our brothers and sisters who are our Protestant brothers and sisters, so perhaps those who are you know, non-denominational of, of some stripe or kind, or Anglican brothers and sisters, or whoever it might be. Some of them are, not all of them by any means, but some of them are actually kind of taking that idea that I just mentioned that has a great resurgence right now. Well, if we just adapt our teaching, or if we just kind of adapt what it means to be Christian a little more pleasantly to the world and to the world's ideal, well, then things will be much, much better. Our churches will be packed again. People will be here. And yet, if you look at the statistics, as some of these are brothers and sisters and some of these communions have done so, the numbers have not gone up, actually. They've gone really far down. They're doing just as poorly, if not more, far more poorly than we are. The answer isn't to, quote-unquote, update the church or get with the times. That's not what truly is the problem here. Obviously, there's a host of problems. But one of the problems, I think, and one of the realities that's behind some of this, again, these statistics that we just heard, is, I think, rooted in this notion that God is just kind of this distant figure who kind of set the world in motion. He kind of checks in on us every once in a while. Maybe if things are going really poorly or maybe if, you know, we find ourselves like we do right now in this crazy pandemic, that maybe he'll kind of intervene and do something for us to help us if we, if we pray hard enough and if we're really good people. But ultimately, he's not all that interested in our lives. Ultimately, the world that he's kind of set in motion is up to us to kind of lead or to kind of control or to manage or to keep going. And the rules and the laws of God, perhaps the commandments what the church would put forth, what's been given to us through the church, the tradition of the church, the truth of God, those things are just kind of, in a certain sense, we might think just constructs, perhaps, that are, can be changed or can be altered, and they're just kind of these old guys in Rome at the Vatican who wear the hats, you know, and they, they have the authority or the power just to kind of modify or tweak these things as they need to, and perhaps they're just way out of touch and way out of date, and that's why we have these old, archaic kind of rules. But I don't think that's quite the, the issue, obviously, that the, it's just these old Catholic guys in Rome. The issue is how many Catholics, how most of, perhaps many of us even, again, see God. That the church, that she's not really, in a certain sense, the one who um, 
is her Lord and Master, is not really alive, that he's not really speaking right now, that he's not really interested in our lives. A good number of Catholics, in fact, one kind of popular evangelist would say, as she did a poll, and I think this is also with, uh, again, another Pew, Pew Research poll, a good number of Catholics, it's something like almost just under half don't even believe that it's possible to have a personal relationship or a personal encounter of some kind with God. They don't even believe that God is actually personal, that he actually has something to say to us, that he actually wants to reveal himself to us, that he actually wants to know us, that he wants to be known by us. And so our life as Catholics then, if, if that is the case, is just kind of this twofold thing. I just be good, or try to do what's right, and keep the rules, and maybe I'll check in every once in a while, drop some money in the basket, hopefully get buried from here, and that's pretty much it. But the reality is God is alive. He has something to say to us. He wants to break into our lives. He wants us to hear him. He has something to say to us this morning, and in every Mass as we come, he wants to reveal himself to us. He wants to be known by us. He wants to know us. That's what we're invited to this morning. It's the encounter in today's Gospel as Jesus walks by and We hear those words, Behold, the Lamb of God, as he's pointed out to the two disciples. And they start following him. And he turns to them. And he looks at them. And he does the same to us. He wants to do the same with us. And he says something to them. He says, What are you looking for? And they say, Master, or Rabbi, Teacher, Where are you staying? And he says, come and see. This personal encounter, this being looked at by the very eternal Son of God, being caught in his gaze and being invited to come after him, is what God wants to do with each of us. He wants to hear us, sorry, he wants wants us to hear him call us by name. He wants us to ask the question, or wants us to rather follow him so that he can ask us the question, what are you looking for? That's what he wants to ask us this morning. Perhaps as you're here at Mass, perhaps you do hear him speak, perhaps you're with him often in prayer and all these things, or perhaps you're not. And maybe the question he is asking this morning in a certain sense is, what are you looking for? What are you longing for in your heart? What are the desires of your heart? Jesus the only eternal Son of God who we just celebrated, who's taken on flesh for us, out of love for us, so as to rescue us from sin, and not just from our, our sins as you know, sinful deeds themselves, but from the very power of sin, from the kingdom of darkness, from the captivity of sin, from the evil one and from his lies, from the enslavement of sin, who wants to set us free, wants to liberate the captives. Jesus wants to have this sort of encounter with us. Do we even believe it's possible? Do you even believe it's possible? Do you believe that God actually wants to encounter you this morning as we're here at the Holy Altar? Do you believe that as I have the unamazing or unbelievable and amazing privilege, sorry, I can't talk yet because the espresso hasn't kicked in, as I have this unbelievable privilege to hold him up in a few minutes at the Holy Altar and say, behold, the Lamb of God, as you get to, to gaze at him, do you believe that he actually might want to say something to you that he might want to kind of catch you in his gaze, that he might want to manifest or reveal his love to you? Or do we just kind of think God is, in some sense, dead? That he doesn't really, he's not really active, he's not really alive, there's nothing much that he can really give me here. That life is really up to me, it's up to my doing. That's what we're invited to, we're invited to this encounter with him. And we are every day, certainly here at the Holy Altar, but even at our homes, most especially now as we go through this pandemic, Are we praying? Are we opening up the scriptures? Do we know when we have trials or huge catastrophes in our lives that God actually has something for us? Maybe he wants to give us a word. Maybe he wants to to give us a promise or a truth that will lead us through and give us strength and hope and courage as we go through trying times. Do we actually believe that he even wants to, to do something like that? Or again, do we just kind of say, well, it's really just up to me. Maybe I'll say a perfunctory Our Father, and then I'll get on my way and just kind of grip my teeth and bear it. So he wants to have this encounter with us. And again, I don't think many 
Many in the church perhaps even know this, which is why, we, again, we just see the church just kind of this arbitrary set of rules, and it's just this kind of empty, you know, kind of banal thing that we just come and do on Sundays every once in a while if we really feel like we owe God something. And the final thing is, as I ramble on this morning, perhaps my final point is, where are you? As we hear the Lord perhaps speak our names or call us or have this encounter with him as the two disciples do in the gospel, the Lord invites us to this, not to just hear him call our names, but he invites us to respond. He invites us to respond in complete and total surrender. He invites us to respond like Samuel does. He invites us to respond, like I mentioned in the prayer in the antiphon, Behold me, Lord, I come to do your will. Just as the two disciples are following Jesus, Andrew being one of them, and he says, what are you looking for? Jesus says, come, or, what does he say? I'm losing it right now in my mind. Come and you will see. It's this invitation to let go of the safety of the shore in a certain sense. To let go of the safety of our preconceived notions of what it means to follow Jesus. To put out into the deep, as St. John Paul II would say. The invitation to leave everything behind and to come away with Jesus. To come away with God himself, the great lover of our souls. It's what we're looking for. It's what we're longing for. Do we actually believe that he wants to have this kind of encounter with us this morning? Do we actually believe it's even possible? And if we believe that, where are we this morning? As he calls us, as he invites us to come away with him, do we have this posture like Samuel says in a certain sense? As he comes to Eli, as he hears the Lord calling his name, he thinks it's Eli, Eli you know, says, go back to sleep. But he says, I did not call you my son. If you hear it again, say, here I am. I'm sorry. Speak, Lord, your servant is listening. As we hear the Lord's voice this morning, as we encounter the Lord, may our posture be much like Samuel's. May it be a posture of surrender. No matter what it is that he's calling us to, no matter what it is that he wants to lead us through, may we respond much like Samuel and say, Behold me, Lord, I come to do your will. I'm here for you. I'm all yours. Whatever you want, I want to be with you. I want to come away with you. May we have the grace as we receive the Most Holy Eucharist to respond like Samuel responded. May we have the grace to, to our, have our ears opened and our hearts open that God is actually alive, that he wants to speak to us, that he wants to encounter us. And may we respond in complete and total surrender. Together, let us profess our faith using the words of the Nicene Creed. I believe in one God, the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, of all things visible and invisible. I believe in one Lord, Jesus Christ, the only begotten Son of God, born of the Father before all ages, God from God, light from light, true God from true God, begotten, not made, consubstantial with the Father. Through him all things were made. For us men and for our salvation, he came down from heaven, and by the Holy Spirit was incarnate of the Virgin Mary and became man. For our sake he was crucified under Pontius Pilate. He suffered death and was buried, and rose again on the third day in accordance with the scriptures. He ascended into heaven and is seated at the right hand of the Father, he will come again in glory to judge the living and the dead, and his kingdom will have no end. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Lord, the giver of life, who proceeds from the Father and the Son, who with the Father and the Son is adored and glorified, who has spoken through the prophets. I believe in one holy Catholic and apostolic church. I confess one baptism for the forgiveness of sins. 
and I look forward to the resurrection of the dead and the life of the world to come. Amen. To our Heavenly Father, who is rich in mercy, we offer our prayers and petitions. That those who lead our church may receive God's guidance and strength, we pray to the Lord. Lord, hear our prayer. That those suffering oppression throughout the world may experience the peace of Christ in their lands and in their lives, we pray to the Lord. Lord, hear our prayer. That those who struggle with chronic physical ailments may grow strong under the gentle and nurturing hand of Christ, we pray to the Lord. Lord, hear our prayer. That Jesus' love may conform us evermore to his own heart as we strive to follow him more closely, we pray to the Lord. Lord, hear our prayer. For all that we keep in our hearts, and for those we are asked to remember, especially Richard Malacca and Joseph DiGiuseppe, we pray to the Lord. Lord, hear our prayer. For the sick and suffering, especially Father Tim Mazur, Ron D'Alessandro, Barbara Donnelly, and Kathleen Saldana, may they know the healing presence of Jesus, we pray to the Lord. Lord, hear our prayer. For those who have died this past week, especially Norbert Lurch, Salvatore Picciaro, Harley Heinbuck, and Vita Olenizak. May they pray, find eternal rest. We pray to the Lord. Lord, Lord, hear our prayer. Mighty Father, we offer you all these prayers with great confidence in your love and your power. You who have taken on flesh so as to rescue us in Jesus, we present these prayers to you, all the intentions that we uphold in the silence of our hearts. We pray that in your mercy you be pleased to grant them, for we make them all in the name of Jesus, who is Lord both now and forever. Amen.
Dear brethren, that my sacrifice and yours may be acceptable to God, the Almighty Father. Grant us, O Lord, we pray, that we may participate worthily in these mysteries. For whenever the memorial of this sacrifice is celebrated, the work of our redemption is accomplished. Through Christ our Lord. Amen. The Lord be with you. Lift up your hearts. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. It is truly right and just, our duty and our salvation, always and everywhere to give you thanks, Lord, Holy Father, Almighty and Eternal God, through Christ our Lord. For out of compassion for the waywardness that is ours, he humbled himself and was born of the Virgin. By the passion of the cross, he freed us from unending death, and by rising from the dead, he gave us life eternal. And so with angels and archangels, with thrones and dominions, and with all the hosts and powers of heaven, we sing the hymn of your glory, as without end we acclaim. To you, therefore, most merciful Father, we make humble prayer and petition through Jesus Christ, your Son, our Lord, that you accept and bless these gifts, these offerings, these holy and unblemished sacrifices, which we offer you firstly for your holy Catholic Church. Be pleased to grant her peace, to guard, unite, and govern her throughout the whole world, together with your servant Francis, our Pope, and Alan, our Bishop, and all those who, holding to the truth, hand on the Catholic and apostolic faith. Remember, Lord, your servants. And all gathered here, whose faith and devotion are known to you, for them we offer you this sacrifice of praise, or they offer it for themselves and all who are dear to them, for the redemption of their souls and hope of health and well-being, and paying their homage to you, the eternal God, living and true. In communion with those whose memory we venerate, especially the glorious ever-Virgin Mary, Mother of our God and Lord Jesus Christ, and blessed Joseph, her spouse, your blessed apostles and martyrs, Peter and Paul, Andrew, James, John, Thomas, James, Philip, Bartholomew, Matthew, Simon and Jude, Linus, Cletus, Clement, Sixtus, Cornelius, Cyprian, Lawrence, Chrysogonus, John and Paul, Cosmos and Damian, and all your saints. We ask that through their merits and prayers and all things, we may be defended by your protecting help. Therefore, Lord, we pray graciously accept this oblation of our service, that of your whole family. Order our days in your peace and command that we be delivered from eternal damnation and counted among the flock of those you have chosen. Be pleased, O God, we pray, to bless, acknowledge, and approve this offering in every respect. Make it spiritual and acceptable so that it may become for us the body and blood of your most beloved Son, our Lord Jesus Christ. On the day before he was to suffer, he took bread in his holy and venerable hands, and with eyes raised to heaven, to you, O God, his almighty Father, giving you thanks, he said the blessing, broke the bread, and gave it to his disciples, saying, Take this, all of you, and eat of it, for this is my body, which will be given up for you.
In a similar way, when supper was ended, he took this precious chalice in his holy and venerable hands, and once more giving you thanks, he said the blessing and gave the chalice to his disciples, saying, Take this, all of you, and drink from it, for this is the chalice of my blood, the blood of the new and eternal covenant, which will be poured out for you and for many for the forgiveness of sins. Do this in memory of me. Therefore, O Lord, as we celebrate the memorial of the blessed passion, the resurrection from the dead, and the glorious ascension into heaven of Christ, your Son, our Lord, we, your servants and your holy people, offer to your glorious majesty from the gifts that you have given us, this pure victim, this holy victim, this spotless victim, the holy bread of eternal life and the chalice of everlasting salvation. Be pleased to look upon these offerings with a serene and kindly countenance, and to accept them as once you were pleased to accept the gifts of your servant, Abel the just, the sacrifice of Abraham our father in faith, and the offering of your high priest Melchizedek, a holy sacrifice, a spotless victim. In humble prayer we ask you, Almighty God, command that these gifts be borne by the hands of your holy angel to your altar on high, in the sight of your divine majesty, so that all of us who through this participation at the altar receive the most holy body and blood of your Son, may be filled with every grace and heavenly blessing. Remember also, Lord, your servants who have gone before us with the sign of faith and rest in the sleep of peace. Grant them, O Lord, we pray, and all who sleep in Christ, a place of refreshment, light, and peace. To us also, your servants who those sinners, hope in your abundant mercies, Graciously grant some share in fellowship with your holy apostles and martyrs, with John the Baptist, Stephen, Matthias, Barnabas, Ignatius, Alexander, Marcellinus, Peter, Felicity, Perpetua, Agatha, Lucy, Agnes, Cecilia, Anastasia, and all your saints. Admit us, we beseech you, into their company, not weighing our merits, but granting us your pardon, through Christ our Lord, through whom you continue to make all these good things, O Lord. You sanctify them, fill them with life, bless them, and bestow them upon us. Through him and with him and in him, O God Almighty Father, in the unity of the Holy Spirit, all glory and honor is yours forever and ever. Savior's command informed by divine teaching, we dare to say, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. Deliver us, Lord, we pray, from every evil. Graciously grant peace in our days, that by the help of your mercy, we may be always free from sin and safe from all distress 
as we await the blessed hope in the coming of our Savior, Jesus Christ. For the kingdom, the power, and the glory are yours, now and forever. Lord Jesus Christ, who said to your apostles, Peace I leave you, my peace I give you. Look not on our sins, but on the faith of your church, and graciously grant her peace and unity in accordance with your will, who live and reign forever and ever. Peace of the Lord be with you always. Behold the Lamb of God, behold him who takes away the sins of the world. Blessed are those called to the supper of the Lamb. Lord, I am not worthy that you should enter under my roof, but only say the word, my soul shall be saved.
Let us pray. Pour on us, O Lord, the spirit of your love, 
and in your kindness make those you have nourished by this one heavenly bread, one in mind and heart, through Christ our Lord. Amen. There are no announcements this week. I just want to thank the, the deacon here very much. This is my, I don't often have a deacon, so I get to serve here as a deacon, so thank you, deacon, very much for your humble service and help, and uh, just encourage us as we um, go into the week to, again, just to expect that the Lord has something to say to us and to have this posture that's ready to listen and ready to uh, humbly obey. And let's also remember Father Tim, as, as he always would do faithfully to Our Lady, let's offer a Hail Mary in particular for him and for his recovery as we pray. Hail Mary, full of grace, the Lord is with thee. Blessed art thou among women, and blessed is the fruit of thy womb, Jesus. Holy Mary, Mother of God, pray for us sinners, now and at the hour of our death. Amen. The Lord be with you. May Almighty God bless you, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Go forth, the Mass has ended. Thanks be to God. Thanks for your help.